Very good. Well, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to the Little Lunch Lectures today. Um, I am Stephanie Borek, the Director of Donor Relations for the Coastal Land Trust. Uh, just a reminder for anybody who hasn't heard me say this 37 times over the last year, um, we are recording and the presentation is up on Facebook Live today. Um, so you can keep your camera on if you want, or you can turn it off if you want. Of course, you know, we always love to see your faces. Um, there will be a couple of links in the chat if you want to check those out. And um, finally, as always, we will keep everybody on mute during uh, the talk. But if you have a question, feel free to type it into the chat even during the meeting. Um, but then at the end, we'll go back and, and catch those questions. Um, or at the end, you can unmute and ask your question yourself. Um, today, I'm pleased to uh, introduce Kaylin Hernandez, uh, a former colleague and friend of mine. Uh, Kaylin is a wild biolo wildlife biologist, originally from Arkansas. She has worked in the environmental field in varied positions in the Florida Keys, Netherlands Antilles, and coastal Louisiana before settling in Wilmington with her family. She has been uh, with Cape Fear River Watch as their environmental educator um, and program manager for 10 years and has a deep love for the environment and passion for educating children. Okay, Lynn today is going to give us an introduction to Cape Fear River Watch and a special look at Greenfield Lake, a wild and wonderful place in the heart of Wilmington. So Kaylin, we are super glad to have you today and um, it's all you. All right, thank you for that introduction, Stephanie. Um, happy to be here. I'm really happy to be able to provide this presentation today. It's gonna be a different kind of presentation than I've given before. Um, so I'll just briefly um, do an overview about Cape Fear River Watch and then jump right in to, um, to the things that the wonders and beauties of Greenfield Lake. So first of all, Cape River Watch is a nonprofit environmental organization and we're tasked with protecting and improving the water quality of the lower Cape Fear River Basin for all people. And it's not just the lower Cape Fear River Basin, it's the Cape Fear River Basin for all people through education, advocacy, and action. Um, we're under the Waterkeepers Umbrella, um, Waterkeepers Alliance, and they are a worldwide watchdog group. Um, and so under there, there are river keepers worldwide that protect specific waterways. And some of those river keepers have organizations like Cape Fear River Watch that support the work that they do. Um, Cape Fear River Watch has seven people on staff and I've been with them for 10 years. Um, so the Cape Fear River Basin, as you can see here, is the largest river basin in the state of North Carolina. Um, it's approximately the size of New Hampshire, so really big. Um, and so we don't only protect and improve the water quality of the river itself, but all the watersheds that surround the Cape Fear River, as well, including the Greenfield Lake watershed. Um, it's also considered a biodiversity hotspot. Um, with more than 14 different ecosystems in North Carolina's coastal plain um, and an additional six different types of aquatic ecosystems within the Cape Fear River Basin. Um, it was also just um, recognized in 2016 as um, a nor the North American coastal plain was recognized as a global biodiversity hotspot um, globally with over 1500 endemic vascular plants. So action is one of the arms of our mission and some of the things that we do are water quality. We have a couple of programs and we have a citizen science water quality monitoring program and we conduct research. We get people out on the water in kayaks and other ways. We clean up our watersheds. Just last year alone, we cleaned up over eight tons of trash from our local waterways. And we have a lot of different service activities like um, storm drain marking, like this group of kids. Um, so the idea is to get people to care about our, our regions, rivers, streams, and tributaries as much as we do through these, these actions. We're heavily involved with advocacy. Um, we want to be considered the voice of the river. Um, so we like to speak up in favor of things that will make the river cleaner, healthier, and more beautiful. So when policy decisions are being made, um, we make sure that we are part of those discussions. And then education, um, my passion, <laughs> education. So we've been um, working on education programs and developing edu education programs um, for years and we have a lot of different things going on. Um, and these programs are designed for both children and adults. Um, so we do festivals, 
Um, we have programs in schools, we have programs at the Battleship and at the Lake and Eagles Island um, and in classrooms. And we also have a very robust intern program. Um, I don't think we could do um, a third of the things that we do without our interns. Um, it's been a joy for me to manage for the past 10 years. Um, these college students usually bring in fresh creative ideas, which I think you know, is extremely beneficial to the organization. Um, and also the, the vast number of things that they get to do, um, I think are very, is very beneficial to them in deciding on which way they wanna go with their career and make real impact you know, once they're out there in the working world. And uh, the guy down in the corner, down here in the lower left corner, Tony, was actually a great intern, although he doesn't appear to be right there. <laughs> but we work our interns pretty hard sometimes. And so that was after a day with our summer campers, with 22 summer campers at the Swamp Park. And so it just wipes them out. <laughs> and now on to Greenfield Lake. So first of all, just in case you don't know where Greenfield Lake is, um, I included this. Um, Google Earth image um, showing where it is. So if you look over to the top left, you'll see Greenfield Lake. And so to get an idea of where that is, um, we have the Cape Fear River um, all the way to the left, and you have um, the Intercoastal Waterway and the Atlantic Ocean over here to the right. And there's actually a natural ridge that runs through the center of town like this. And so when rain falls, it'll fall in the direction toward the intercoastal waterway, it's on this side of the ridge and it'll Im make impacts to the intercoastal waterway and the Atlantic Ocean. Um, if it falls within one of the watersheds that are to um, west of the ridge, um, then impacts will be made to the Cape Fear River. But of course, where does the Cape Fear River go to? The Atlantic Ocean. So in any impacts in any of this, you know, these areas are gonna end up impacting the Atlantic Ocean. And then just a little closer view of Greenfield Lake. I'm gonna stay on this slide for a couple of minutes. So Greenfield Lake is a 90 acre lake and it is within a 210 acre park called Greenfield Park. Um, and it also serves as a catchment basement for over 2,500 acres. And as you can see in this, um, a lot of the, the, the land around Greenfield Lake that it serves as a catchment basement for is developed, largely developed. It's an urban lake. So this means that we have a lot of impervious surfaces, um, such as rooftops and driveways and parking lots and that sort of thing. So um, when it rains, um, non-point source pollutants like um, pet waste and pesticides and fertilizers and oil and gas from cars and trash and sediment um, don't have a chance to soak into the ground to recharge groundwater, but instead become part of the stormwater issue and run off with those hard impervious surfaces. Um, like most muni municipalities in this country, all of the stormwater within a watershed is directed into a specific body of water. And so in this case, that's Greenfield Lake. So all of those non-point source pollutants that I just discussed are directed intentionally into Greenfield Lake and untreated. So at one time, Greenfield Lake um, was very pristine. Um, originally, it was just a stream. If you look to the top left part of the lake, you'll see some cypress stands in the middle and you'll see how there's like a, a stream that's sort of snaking through this part. That's where the old creek bed is, the original stream of the lake. And in the 1730s, Dr. Samuel Green dammed it up to create the lake um, to power his grist mill. So on the other side of the spillway over here, it's about a half a mile to the Cape Fear River and the Cape Fear River is brackish over there. And then inside Greenfield Lake, it's all fresh water and it's um, fed by a freshwater lens. Um, so yeah, at one time it was super pristine, but then the city bought it in 1925 for um, $25,000, directed all the stormwater into it. And um, at one time there was a company that actually bottled the water out of the lake to drink. That's how pristine it was. But now you certainly wouldn't want to drink the water. You probably wouldn't want to swim in the water. Um, yeah, you wouldn't drink or catch the fish and eat the fish out of the water either. Um, but having said all those things, the lake itself is absolutely beautiful. It really is. When you get out there on the lake, um, you, you feel as if you're far away from all the hustle and bustle of daily life. Um, and we try and get people out there as much as we can. It's been a little more difficult, you know, with the pandemic, like all other things have been more difficult with the pandemic. 
Um, so we've been able to get very small groups out at a time. In the fall, I think we got a total of 40 people out there in small groups so that they can also enjoy um, the beauty and the wildlife of Greenfield Lake. And I, I do tend to focus on wildlife and I'm really happy that I get to focus on wildlife in this presentation. All of the photographs um, from this point forward, um, it's basically gonna be a picture show. And um, a photographer named Brian Putnam donated all of these photographs to us and every single photograph that you'll see was taken at Greenfield Lake. So this one is an anhinga. Um, anhingas are super cool birds. They have a really easy scientific name to remember, anhinga, anhinga. Um, <laughs> so that is a Brazilian Tupi language term um, and it means devil bird or snake bird. Um, so it's called, a lot of people call it a snake bird. And the reason is because it's, its whole body, unlike other waterfowl who, that's buoyant and you see their whole body floating on the surface, the anhinga's body isn't very buoyant. And that's what makes it such an excellent swimmer underwater. But it sinks and all you can see is the head up above and the neck up above the water. And it looks like a snake that's about to strike. And that's why a lot of people refer to it as the snake bird. And you often see them um, on branches and trees like this after they've been fishing and um, they spread their wings out like that because they have to thermoregulate after fishing. And this is a female anhinga. Um, this anhinga you can tell is female because of the tan neck all the way down into its chest. Um, and you can also see that really sharp beak and I love this photograph because it it shows that specialized hinge in its neck um, which makes it such a great angler. So they can swim really fast, but they can also remain completely stealthy and still underwater. And so when an unwary fish swims in front of it, it uses that specialized hinge in its neck to like to dart out real fast and stab the fish. And then it comes up with a fish, it flips it up in the air and it always swallows it head first. So it's an amazing, amazing animal. <laughs> and they're all over the lake. And this guy, I think we've probably, we're all pretty um, familiar with. Um, this is the Canada goose. Um, the Canada goose is the largest of the true goose. Um, he lives up to 24 years and there have been um, some, there's been one goose that was tracked and he lived up to be 31 years old. Um, and like many other waterways, freshwater waterways um, around North America, you see them commonly at Greenfield Lake. Um, so Canada geese, mallards, green wing tills, and trumpeter swans all do something called dabble, and um, dabble or tip up. And um, that's what this guy is doing, he's dabbling. And um, so that just means they stick their, their long necks down into the water to um, feed off um, benthic vegetation. So the trumpeter swan and the Canada goose are most successful at this because they have those long necks so they can get reach deeper into pockets. Um, and they have on their bill, it's a soft lined rounded bill and they use that for touching. So they use it much like a child would in a sand pit to find a penny, you know, just like with their touch with their bill. Um, and so Greenfield Lake is pretty shallow. It's only five feet on average. Um, a lot of people think it's deeper than that, but it's very shallow. So that means there, there's a lot of excellent foraging habitat, you know, for the Canada goose at Greenfield Lake. And here we have um, a Canada goose with a mallard. And um, these two, this Canada goose and this mallard, I've been following for years. They are a couple, they're a pair. And so believe it or not, sometimes when conditions are a little off, so for example, possibly maybe the mallard's flock migrated without him and left him there. And the Canada goose just couldn't find a suitable mate of his own species they'll mate and they'll, um, they can produce hybrid offspring. And that hybrid offspring then is sterile. Um, and another thing that happens with non-traditional pairings and especially with the mallard or the drake, the greenhead, um, they will often pair up with the same gender. And so you'll see two male mallards that have paired up and actually remain monogamous for their entire life. So um, as Valentine's Day is approaching, I just wanted to share this information with you to keep in mind that love is love. <laughs> and we'll move on to the next one. All right, this guy you see everywhere at Greenfield Lake and he's an amazing creature. So this is the 
the great blue heron. Um, the great blue heron is the largest um, of the herons in North Carolina. Um, he gets to be 35 years old um, and he's so big, he's, um, he can be 6.6 .6 foot of a wingspan. And also if he was standing next to a six foot man, he could come up to that man's chest. So that's how large a great blue heron can be. Um, I was reading on one of our neighborhood sites, someone's like, I just moved here and I saw this giant bird that looked like a pterodactyl and it swooped through the backyard and does anyone know what this huge thing is? And I'm like, yeah, <laughs> we know what that is. Um, but they do most closely resemble um, a pterodactyl, you know, in the way that they're made up. Um, and so they're also very widespread um, all around the United States and Southern Canada. And this is because they have a, a variable diet. Um, they can eat a lot of different kinds of things found in a lot of different types of ecosystems. Um, so this, this great blue heron's at the dock at, um, where the boathouse is at Greenfield Lake. And he's kind of a regular there, kind of scrappy looking fella. And you can see how he's been preening himself. There's actually, he was, he was preening himself so hard that he knocked a feather out. <laughs> but yeah, um, speaking of dinosaurs, um, the American alligator is something that a lot of people come to Greenfield Lake um, to see. Um, they're only found in southeastern United States. Um, so it's, it's a real treat for people that aren't from around here. Um, there are small populations in Mexico as well, um, but it's from another time. The, the American alligator is from a whole other time. As other, you know, apex predators have evolved, you know, over the last thousands of years, there have been changes. Um, but the American alligator, it's been proven, have, has not had any significant evolutionary change for the last eight million years. So, you know, they're dinosaurs. It's pretty amazing that we have them around still today. Um, they are the largest reptile, um, not surprisingly, in North America. One thing that I love about this picture is that you see the entire um, alligator. And normally you don't get to see the whole alligator, you know, out of the water like this. Um, what you normally would see would just be the, the head when he's swimming around. And you might see just like the wake behind the head as he's swimming and a piece of the tail. But if you know this trick, then you know how long he is without seeing the length. And that is if you look at where the eye is, where this little eye bump is, and then if you look at where the snout is on an alligator, and if you guesstimate about how long that is, and if you think it's about seven inches long, then you can always do the math and know that he's about seven feet in length. So just by seeing the head, you can always tell how long the alligator is. Interesting fact. Um, the alligators will um, lay about 45 eggs in their clutch and um, they protect that clutch for the 60 to 80 days it, it will take for them to hatch and they protect them, you know, aggressively. Um, the thing, the really cool thing I think about alligators is that they are the only reptile that spends any amount of time with their offspring. They'll take care of their offspring for two years which is a quite a long time for a reptile. Um, I love this picture too. We often see these yellow-bellied sliders hanging out with alligators and people are like, aren't, you know, isn't the turtle gonna get eaten? And in fact, turtles are a part of an alligator's diet, but with alligators, their prey is directly related to their own size. And so this turtle's safe um, with this guy and they like to tag along with the alligators when they know that they're safe because they can pick off the scraps and um, that the alligator's leaving behind. So you'll sometimes see them riding on the backs of alligators or just hanging out with them all the time. It's really important not to feed alligators. Um, I'm sure all of you know this, it's unlawful to feed them, but there's a real danger in it, not only um, to the alligator, but also for people because once alligators start associating people with food, um, and then with that, you know, prey relationship, as far as how big they get, um, the bigger the prey. Um, and then people bring small pets to the lake and they've been getting fed and the pets are in danger. Um, and not only are the pets in danger, but the alligators are also in danger because once they get past a certain length, I think it's 10 feet, um, if they've been showing signs of aggression due to being fed by humans and they can be destroyed to keep the public safe.
So don't ever do that. That's a bad idea. Speaking of yellow bellied sliders, um, when we're on the lake, you see these sliders um, all together like this a lot, like anhingas, um, they need to thermoregulate after they've been swimming around in the cool water. Um, so a group of turtles like this is called a bale, B-A-L-E. But when I'm taking people out there, I just like to say there's another turtle party going on. Um, they're everywhere. And I'd say 90% of the, yeah, the turtles in the lake are yellow bellied sliders. Um, there are other types in there. There are red-eared sliders, and um, there are also um, common snapping turtles. A lot of people believe that those are alligator snapping turtles, and I can see why, because they have a giant like alligator-shaped head, and they have kind of a prehistoric-looking alligator tail, but they're just common snapping turtles if you see one here. Um, alligator snapping turtles don't occur where we are now. They occur on the Gulf Coast plains and around the lower half of Florida. Uh, and this is the black crowned night heron. I absolutely love this photograph um, because although globally um, the night heron is the most widely um, distributed of the herons, um, because uh, of its feeding habits, it's called a night heron. It was named that because it forages um, strictly at night is when it goes to get its prey and, it, um, and into the early morning hours. So hence the name. Um, but because of that, you don't get to see them very often because they're very inactive in the daytime and they're also very secretive. Um, so I love that Brian was able to capture um, this black crown night heron so clearly. Um, the black crown night heron is a really excellent um, like hunter um, and it has a really wide diverse um, uh, amount things that it eats, a variety of food. So not only does it eat other fish, does it eat fish and turtles and frogs and spiders, um, but it also eats other small birds. Um, but the strange thing about that is that it's known to be a very gentle nester. And so if another species of bird, a baby chick, is placed into its nest, it will care for the chick. Um, and it's one of the few birds that will do that with a, with a whole different species. And if you go to Squash Branch at Greenfield Lake, that is the branch that's um, closest to Lions Bridge. Um, and this time of year and beginning probably around October until now, if you look real hard, you can find them now, um, these black crown night herons, but you really have to play, pay close attention because they aren't active. They're just resting during the daytime. Um, I love this photograph because it shows that, that plume that's um, shooting off the back of the crest of its head. Um, that's what tells you it's an adult um, black crown night heron. Um, and it's really, even though it's white and it's crown and, and back of its neck is black, um, it's still really hard to see because it's such a narrow, a narrow piece of plumage that sticks up out there. So you rarely see it. And so you can really use it to identify it as an adult, which is one of the few identifying characteristics of the black crown night heron that separates it from the juveniles. Um, if you look around this black crown night heron, you can see that he's in a cypress tree. Um, there's some Spanish moss around the cypress tree. Um, and I can't not say this about the Spanish moss, and that is that it's not from Spain and it's not a moss. <laughs> and so it was just named inaccurately. It's not in the moss family at all. Um, and it's native of, of North America. So, um, but you'll see also the, the cypress seed pods in this photograph, um, the balls, the little round balls. And so when those drop into the water, they, um, they put off this oily sheen and you'll see that all around the lake, these little circular patterns of an oily sheen. And often when people look at that, they think it's pollution. They think it's a petroleum based oily sheen but often it isn't. Um, sometimes it is because it is, you know, we do have those impacts to the lake as well with oil and gas from cars within the watershed, but it's often this too. Um, so if you see that circular pattern to the sheen, um, it might just be the, the seed pods that have fallen off the cypress trees. And um, also if it's not petroleum, it could be an iron eating bacteria that creates this oily sheen, also a natural occurrence. And one way to know the difference is if you take a stick when you run it through the sheen, um, if it disperses and fragments out, sort of pixelates out, then you know it's that oily sheen, that, or you know it's a, a naturally occurring iron-eating bacteria. 
Um, but if it starts to try and come back together in any way and is more streaky, then it's petroleum based and it is pollution. Okay, this is super cool phenomenon that Brian captured unknowingly. Um, so this is a paper wasp and it's on a trumpet creeper. And um, scientists, they, they've been studying this a lot. Scientists have found that there's a specific type of parasite um, that infects the paper wasp. And two thirds of the paper wasps that are found on trumpet creepers have this parasite. If you go to other types of flowering bushes and, um, and you sample a paper wasp, very few of them will have this type of parasite on it. So the preference of the trumpet creeper by the paper wasp um, that, that's infected by the parasite, it's a novel example of co-evolved traits between hosts and parasites. And that's why it's studied so widely. And, um, and it's happening at Greenfield Lake. And we have to talk about the great egret. Um, beautiful, beautiful bird, always a joy to see at Greenfield Lake. It has a wingspan of over five and a half feet. Um, it can be um, separated from other types of egrets, um, but not only its white color, but um, it's, it's solid yellow orange beak. And also its legs are all black and its feet are all black, all going down into one. So that's a good way to identify that one versus some of the other egrets. Um, herons and egrets are all part of one family called Ardeidae, um, which is considered to be the heron family. Um, in North America in the late 1900s, um, the great egrets were almost um, wiped out um, because people were killing them to use their plumage to get to decorate their hats. So um, now because we had some strong conservation measures in place, their populations are back up to a healthy number. Yes, here you can see the five and a half foot wingspan. I just think this is an absolutely beautiful photograph with the bridge in the back at Greenfield Lake. And one last one of the great egret. Um, the male and female work together to build nests and um, their nests can be three feet um, in width. And they're mostly built with sticks and lined with a plant material. And um, they care for the young together until the young fledge. And also in the fall, late fall, if you go out to Greenfield Lake on a kayak and um, as the modified leaves of the cypress trees are changing color, they turn this bright orange color that time of year, which is, happens to be the same kind time of year that you have migratory great egrets roosting in those trees. And so the contrast um, between those bright orange, you know, modified leaves of the cypress trees with those beautiful, big, great egrets is just a beautiful thing to see. And I highly recommend trying to get out to see that. And I have to put the gray squirrel in here. And I know that not all of you are huge fans of the gray squirrel, but I have to say, I think the gray squirrel is underappreciated. I really do, <laughs> but for three reasons. Um, first of all, he's our state mammal. So you have to give him credit for that. Um, second of all, he's highly intelligent. Um, some scientists rank the gray squirrel as being in the top 10 most intelligent animals on our planet. So that's pretty cool. They're capable of memory and abstract thought, um, which are two hallmarks of intelligence. And there was a Princeton University study that showed that they can hide thousands of nuts in nowhere memorize where all those nuts were stashed for months after they stashed them there. And this morning, I couldn't find my favorite pair of glasses. I don't know where I stashed that one pair of glasses. <laughs> so highly intelligent creatures, and they can actually even when they know that they're being watched where they're stashing their nuts, they'll hide the nut under their armpit and, um, and pretend to dig and cache and stash when there's, there's nothing in there just to throw off the thing that's trying to steal their, their nuts. So highly intelligent, so props for that. And the third thing is because they are so acrobatic. We see them frolicking all around Greenfield Lake and probably in your backyard too. They have extraordinarily strong legs and, um, and they use that tail for, for the acrobats, but they also use it if they fall because sometimes they do fall. Um, and they use that, that tail like a parachute 
And they also use it like a cushion to, to cushion the fall when they land. And last and but not least, um, my second favorite bird in the world. This is the immature little blue heron. Um, the little blue heron, um, when it's immature like this, is often mistaken for a snowy egret. Um, there are some ways to tell them apart. Um, one way is to look at the eye. This eye is amazing, isn't it? Um, it's, it's very, very light in color and it kind of, it's very wide and that's the difference between it and a snowy. The snowy's eager its eye is not that wide. Um, the immature little blue looks like it's staring all the time. And there's a very, very, you know, minimal difference in the beaks too with it with snowy egrets. But I think that the most, the easiest way to um, distinguish the two is that um, the immature little blue herons legs are mostly all green going all the way down to the feet, kind of a greenish yellow color. And the snowy egrets have solid yellow feet that, are, that contrast with the leg. And so um, their movement when they're when they're hunting on the side is very slow and methodical. And sometimes they just stand there for a, while, for a while waiting for a little fish to swim up to them. But then every once in a while, very rarely, you'll see them sort of spaz out like that. And they'll use their wings to sort of jut themselves forward to, to grab something before the catch gets away. Um, but they're really fun to watch. Um, they're a beautiful animal. And then when they grow up, they don't look anything like this. They lose all of their white plumage and they become kind of a slate blue color. And that's it for me. Um, did I, how did I do on time, Stephanie? Perfect. Perfection. Okay. Yeah. All right. Great. Awesome presentation, Kaylin. You've got me curious and I've been there before, but I haven't seen half this stuff. So um, thank you very much for giving us a, a photographic tour and piquing our interest about this very cool space. And You're welcome. There, there wasn't enough time to go over all of the many, many other things that you can see at Greenfield Lake. So if any of you are interested in getting out there to learn even more about the history and more of the plants, especially, and see more of the creatures, then, then contact us and we'll, we'll send you on an eco, eco tour with us. Nice. I will uh, invite anybody who has a question for Kaylin to unmute and ask it um, or type it into the chat. Um, I did get a couple of questions to me in the chat. Um, so I will read a couple of those while other people, if you want to unmute, you, you may. Um, so um, you mentioned earlier in your talk about non-point source pollution. Um, and it described a little bit about that, but can you say briefly what is point source pollution? Yes. So non-point source pollution is say you're walking down a tributary to, to Greenfield Lake. Um, you don't really see anything in that stream and then you get to the lake and it just looks kind of dirty. Um, that could be non-point source pollution because you don't know what it is or where it's coming from. Um, point source pollution would be different. If you're walking down the tributary that leads into the lake, you would see a stream of pollutants leading into that lake. And it's usually from a specific source, like a pipe that's discharging, you know, um, toxic pollution into the, the, the waterway. So there's no specific point um, to non-point source pollutants. Um, they come from all over. So with, you know, things like trash that could be coming you know, far away from the lake itself and, and just making its way through storm drains and um, through the watersheds into the lake and same with pet waste, just getting washed over, you know, surfaces and into the lake. Um, it's, it comes from all over and it's not as easy, easily identifiable when you see it as when it's a point source pollutant that has been, you know, discharged from a specific point. Okay, oh, cool. Um... So there was a question um, about the type of kayak in one of the pictures before the wasp. Can you talk uh -oh. about the kayak that you were in, <laughs> if you remember? Oh, boy. Um, maybe I have to go back. We have, Cape River Watch has a fleet of kayaks. Um, and I don't, I don't know in that picture. Does she remember what color the kayak was? <laughs> we can try and go back there. Um, I don't know. It was, it was, a, it was a picture. Uh, it was a Facebook comments. So Which, not, okay, okay, okay. And they want to know what kind of kayak I was in, not yeah. one of the people. Okay. Like right before the wasp. This will be fun. 
<laughs> you get to see all the beautiful photographs all over again. That one? There you go. Yeah. It's a new wave kayak. <laughs> gotcha. Um, I'm going to, I'm guessing it's probably about 14 feet in length. I'm guessing maybe less, but no more than 14 feet. Cool. Um, and related to the kayak, I, I had a question and I asked you this one too earlier this week. Um, but why no, why no PFD um, in, in the, like, why aren't you wearing a PFD? Oh, oh, yeah. So at Greenfield Lake, because the lake is only five feet on average um, throughout the lake, we don't require you to wear a PFD when you're on Greenfield Lake, unless you're a child. Um, children have to wear their PFDs. Adults don't have to, but they do have to have a PFD in the boat with them at all times. Cool. Okay. Um, excellent. And does anybody else have other questions um, for Kaylin? Hi. Um, I'd like to know what does the offspring look like of that mallard and goose? <laughs> so um, I haven't seen that they've reproduced that specific um, Canada goose and that mallard, but I have seen a hybrid at the lake that we actually named Frank at one time. Um, so, and we think that it was probably a hybrid between a Canada goose and a mallard. We don't know if it was that pair though. Yeah. Um, but they look, they, they can look very, sometimes they're solid black. We've seen hybrids that are solid black. And then we've seen hybrids that look kind of like a white fronted goose, um, but they're obviously not white fronted geese, they're hybrids. So um, they vary. They vary. What, what size are they more the goose size or mallard size? Same with the with the variation. The ones that turn out to be all black um, seem to be smaller. The ones that turn out to look like a white fronted goose are larger, more goose size. Oh, awesome. Wow. Thank you. Pretty crazy. You're welcome. Hey, Lynn, do you have ibis there also? And what's the difference in an egret and an ibis? I always get them confused. Yes. In fact, Brian gave me an awesome photograph, a few photographs of a white ibis um, at, at the oh. lake. I just didn't have time to, to fit it in like so many of the other things I didn't have time to fit in. Oh. Uh, but yes, there are white ibis at the lake. And um, right now I'm seeing white ibis in people's front yards. I don't know if you guys have, but white ibis um, are the white birds that have a long curvy beak, real long and real curvy beak. And they use that beak to, um, to dig underground to get insects. That's what that curvy beak's for. And it's in yards and grasses and any sort of soft, um, soft grassland area like that. We have the largest um, nesting colony of white ibis um, in the United States, just south of here, um, right at Southport on Saturday Island. Only, you can only get out there if you work for Audubon um, because it's such a special place for white ibis. Um, there's also glossy ibis out there. They're slightly different than the white ibis. They're not solid white. Um, and they also nest out at Battery Island. And then you wanted to know the difference between the ibis and the great egret? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Well, so the first difference is the size. Um, the great egrets are larger, but in the bird world, you really shouldn't use size to, to distinguish differences in species. Um, and so definitely the beak, no doubt the beak, the white, um, the great egret has a robust, all yellow, um, straight beak. Um, the, the white ibis has more of an orangey beak. Um, it can almost look dirty orange at times, probably because it's been in the ground and dirty for real. <laughs> um, and it's very, very curved. Um, so those are, those are two distinct differences between the two. I don't have a question. I just wanted to say, that this is Dane. I work with Kaylin at Cape River Watch. I did put a link in, if anyone's interested, I saw a comment about hoping for more reptiles and Kaylin did an amazing oh. vi vir virtual eco tour of Greenfield Lake and recorded it. It's a video and it's on our YouTube channel and it is amazing. So I encourage you to check it out. I put the link in the chat. Thank you, Dana. Sure, of course. Hi. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, another comment about how awesome Greenfield Lake is for birding. Um, and that was evidenced by many of the photos that you shared. Um, and, you know, there's just, there's a lot to see and explore there. So, um, yeah, if anybody else has another question, now's the time. But if not, that was wonderful, Kaylin. Thank you so much. I learned more than any other presentation. <laughs> Ah! <laughs> oh, thank you, Jeannie. 
Thank you. <laughs> photographer's donation is priceless. Oh my gosh, he, he's really amazing. Brian Putnam. So I put a little thing down at the bottom if you wanted to check out more of his work. There's the website that you can go to right there. But he is an incredible photographer and we're so lucky to um, have had these photographs to finally be able to use. I was just excited to be able to have this opportunity to show you guys the, these great photos. That's awesome. Um, Caitlin, yeah, thank you so much for, for being here. And, and Jeannie should know she's been to like all of the Little Lunch Lectures. So um, that is high praise coming from a 100% a attendee of the Little Lunch Lectures. So <laughs> um, everybody, please come back next week to Little Lunch Lectures. Um, our, our friend Nick Lucchetti, who is an archaeologist with James River Institute, will be here to talk um, he, he was with us back in May, and he talked all about Site X, um, which is in Bertie County, and um, he found some evidence, um, archaeological evidence, that um, a branch of the uh, lost colonists might have settled there. And recently, news came out this fall that other um, artifacts have been found about two miles north of there at another site called Site Y. Um, and Nick, Nick found those as well. And um, he will be joining us to talk about what new things that he has found at, at another site, possibly a splinter group of the lost colonists. So that's next week. Um, on February 26, Carolina Beach State Park will present about that um, awesome special place. And um, we have a lineup uh, all the way into April, not every single week yet, but I'm working on it. Um, but we have most of March filled, most of April filled. Um, so you can check out our website at coastallandtrust.org slash lectures or slash events and, um, and see what's coming. But uh, the next two weeks at least, um, please make sure to come back um, and, and be with us. Um, all right, I really appreciate everyone being here today. Thank you again, Kaylin, and uh, we'll see you guys soon. Okay, this, this is Charlie Winterberg. Hey, Kaylin, just want to say hello to you. You and I have been talking a lot. It's the first yes. time we've face to face in a way. Yeah. So Hi. Anyway, just say hello. We will continue to talk as, as required. Sounds great. Looking forward to it. Do you ever do the proposal yet? What's that? Do you ever do the proposal to uh, keep your Audubon yet? No, because I wasn't invited to submit the proposal. I did reach out to them. I'm sort of waiting for an invitation. Okay, I'll bug them. Great. I'll, bug, I'll make sure you get, get the invited. Good, I'm on the ready. <laughs> okay, thank you. Good presentation. Thank you so much. And that's the thing you want to hear. Yeah. I'm going to talk, right? <laughs> I'm jealous. Right. <laughs> cool. Bye, everybody. Thanks again. Have a Stay great day. Stay healthy. Stay warm. Bye-bye. <laughs>